Okay, so uh, what would you say made the funnel distinct from similar organizations at the time in Toronto or in North America more generally? What made the funnel distinct? Well, first off, I think some of the things that make the funnel distinct, um, distinctive in its time are unfamiliar to people now. So it is important to understand some distinctions that may not be operative in the same way as they used to be. I would say that now in, you know, the, in 2011, uh, we are in a kind of digital cinema um, terrain where the relationship between interactive, still moving images, images, video and film um, are very um, porous and elastic and there's a lot of traffic. Also, um, the internet, huge uh, change and leveler, I guess, uh, provides a, a different uh, set of networks of distribution. Right. So in order to understand the funnel's relevance back in 1980, uh, you need to scroll back to different historic and technological conditions. Um, for one thing, there was quite a distinction between film and experimental film and video practices at that time, right? It was, uh, gender was different at that time, how gender was performed, how general gender was read, and its roles within experimental um, culture. I would say uh, the traditions of experimental film are more situated in, um, well, for one thing, the, the, okay, let's first technology and gender. Um, one of the distinctive things about video when it came on the scene was its capacity to do, to, you know, to synchronize sound, to mm -hmm. make image and picture amalgamated in the same moving image frame, and it facilitated uh, inexpensive capacity to do sync, to perform sync. And with that sync came the capacity to talk to the camera. And so early video art, like Sackville on Yours by Colin Campbell or something, um, it really it's about the talking head as the mm -hmm. artist head and as the community-based media person finding a voice and being able to talk. And within that, I think you see a lot of gender activism. You see a lot of activism around feminist practices, around early queer culture, around um, you know, early sort of alternative TV culture, like we will not be beaten. Now, so that's one side of the sort of video frame. Now, distinguishing experimental film practices from that, we also see a history of women's practice, like Maya Darren, for example, but um, much more, um, for one thing, images, much more work on the manipulation of images, on non-synchronous sound, and a, a, a tradition that may have been more sort of situated within, I guess, uh, I was going to say like, kind of like gallery art, it was pretty much guys, you know, that were mm -hmm. the dominant bunnies in the experimental film world. So the funnel, um, was the beginning of a point of rupture, I think, with that kind of film experimentalism. This maybe differentiates the funnel from some of its predecessors in New York. Um, you start to see at the funnel um, the emergence of more feminist and queer core practices and the level of experimental filmmaking as well. But uh, still, uh, with tension with um, other elements in the experimental film community that were really wedded to a kind of abs abstract expressionism, I guess, and a very sort of heroic guy sort of uh, model of what the artist might be. So the funnel was distinctive too in its connection to punk culture, which is of its time, right? So you have zines, including queer core zines, being edited and distributed out of the funnel, um, like uh, G.B. Jones and, and uh, Midiana Dara, I mentioned before. Um, you have early queer kind of experimental film practices with David McIntosh, with Jack Smith and uh, on Dean, and, and, and then you have like a strong punk and punk documentary kind of piece as well, like 
SIAC you mentioned, which was, you know, integrated with the funnel in its earliest years, and uh, Ross McLaren's documentaries. Uh, yeah, so that's part of what made the funnel distinctive. Another important historical sort of event, of course, was the whole censorship issue. Um, the uh, uh, the Ontario Censor Board um, attempted to force the funnel to comply with uh, the pre-screening of films, uh, and that did actually happen. And it created a sort of a rupture between some art galleries that did not allow their films to be pre-screened by the censor board. The funnel didn't have the same kind of easy choice because it was in a theater, in an actual theater, whereas uh, some of the video um, um, producers were screening their work at a galleries, and I think there was a bit more elasticity in terms of their compliance with the censor board than the film theaters were able, or the film festivals for that matter, were able to exercise. But censorship certainly was a definitive feature um, that shaped how you remember the funnel and, and also what happened there.